across the globe, from Scotland to China, with world's greatest train ride videos. Experience the breathtaking thrill and adventure of authentic train travel as you follow the tracks to unique history, fascinating people, and breathtaking scenery. All aboard! A vast country, more than 40 times the area of France, nearly two and a half times the size of the USA, and a vast railway system, 91,000 miles of lines, a vital network for the country. It handles 45% of the country's passenger traffic, 10 million people a day for a population of 168 million. Without the railroad, the Soviet Union would be paralyzed, for it handles 65% of the freight transport. We're off on a six-day voyage. Alexander is 38 years old. He's married and has three daughters. He's a member of the Communist Party. His assistant is 24 years old. Valentina is also 38. They've been married for 15 years. On Sunday mornings, there's a free market nearby. We won't be showing you the picture postcard Moscow. Red Square, the Golden Domes of the Kremlin, the banks of the Moskova, but everyday Moscow. Lines, the curse of daily life for the Soviets. Waiting in lines takes up several hours a day. Alexander and Valentina take us to their place. This is also something new, being admitted into the privacy of a Soviet home. Will they feel free to speak their minds? They live about 20 kilometers from the center of Moscow. These projects are 20 to 25 stories high. This is the very latest housing. Moscow has nine million inhabitants. They've just moved in. They have 700 square feet for six people, father, mother, the three children, and the grandmother. This is the new norm, but most Muscovites squeezed into tiny apartments don't have nearly that much room. They even have their own kitchen, whereas before, one kitchen shared by two or even four apartments was standard. How do they manage? Alexander's take-home pay is 350 rubles a month, which makes $630 at the official exchange rate. And Valentina spends 400 rubles a month for food. So how do they make ends meet? Valentina makes 80 rubles knitting sweaters, and the grandmother's pension is 30 rubles a month. So they have 460 rubles coming in every month. But then you have to take out 25 rubles for rent, electricity, and the telephone. So for a family of six, that leaves 35 rubles for clothes, leisure, and health. For even though the local doctor is free, the cost of medicine is reimbursed only for serious illnesses. That means that a car, nine or 10,000 rubles, and a two-year wait is something they can only dream about. They had to save for years to buy a TV, 800 rubles for the lowest priced models. The electric clock on the television, Alexander made it himself. 
распутной власти Лютой злой губернии Выпадали молодцу Все шипы до терний Он на биды зачерпнул, зачерпнул The record player costs 600 rubles. We should also add that buying on credit doesn't exist. No, their life isn't easy. Valentina doesn't hide the fact. Perestroika, glasnost, restructuration and transparency. That's all anyone ever talks about. What are you lacking the most? What are we lacking now? Oh, there's a shortage of lots of things. Yeah, lots of things we're missing. But what about you? What are you lacking? What are we lacking? The problem is everyday goods. Often we have the money, but there's nothing to buy with it. Are there certain things you envy about the women that live in the West? Certain things, yes. What specifically do you envy in them? As a woman, I envy them. The abundance, all those products in the stores, food, they can buy clothes, and they're free to travel with their children with their families. You're not talking about traveling within the country, but trips abroad. Yes, they can take trips abroad with their families. They travel. And for that, I do envy them. But otherwise, I do like living in the USSR. Well, I want us to be able to speak out, to express our ideas without being judged or persecuted. Freedom of speech, freedom of expression, is something quite wonderful. Here's one of the rare visible effects of the Perestroika, Arbat Street in Moscow. It's one of the main arteries of the old town. Napoleon's troops used it to reach the Kremlin. Today it's a pedestrian street. This is something new. Painters of all sorts have fled the stodgy academies and taken to the streets. Here they exhibit and sell their work. Before Gorbachev, Arbat Street was just like any other street. It's become a strip of freedom, the envy of all the rest of the Soviet Union. How long will it take to really change things? And how long will the perestroika last? That all depends on how we go about it. It took Lenin a long time to found the party and bring down the old order. It's hard to say. It won't be all that quick. Everyone has to feel it from within. I think our children will feel the effects of the perestroika. One last question, Valya. You're wearing a cross and you have an icon of the Virgin Mary in your home. Are you religious? Do you believe in God? I don't believe in an actual being who exists somewhere up in heaven. 
For me, God is generosity, human kindness, that which is holy in the human soul. That's what God is for me. Back on the Trans-Siberian. Alexander works 41 hours a week. He gets a month's vacation. He'll retire at the age of 51. The railway company gives him and his family one free trip per year. There are two types of car, with two or four sleeping berths. Shared sinks, no showers, and that's a problem for the six-day travelers, those going all the way to Vladivostok. This couple lives in Shitap in Siberia. The old woman just spent 15 days in Moscow visiting her children. You're finally settled in, and already you've come to the realization that the Trans-Siberian of your dreams, with its padded seats, lacquered furniture in the compartments, the dining cars alight with dazzling crystal and silverware, is a thing of the past. You'll come to know a different train. Five thousand eight hundred and ten miles, the longest train route in the world, more than a quarter of the way around the earth. For train lovers, it's a legend, a myth. The journey lasts six days. By plane, it takes eight hours. Noon in Moscow means 7 p.m. in Vladivostok. All the trains are in radio contact with the way stations, which link up with the major stations. The price of the ticket, Moscow Vladivostok, is 69 rubles, about $130, in a compartment with four berths. It's $290 for a double. The sun has managed to come out from behind the clouds to greet us as we pull into Yaroslav, one of the most beautiful cities of Russia. Yaroslav was founded in the year 1010, even before Moscow, as a citadel to control the crossings of the Volga River, a vital trade route. Down through the centuries, the merchants have built more than 50 churches. Yeah, 
In the forest near Yaroslav, we have a curious establishment. It's not a military training camp, and it's not a vacation village. It's more like an amusement park ride, a scale model toy, but it also seems like very cleverly organized indoctrination. These are not all children of railway employees, but they'll all most likely end up working for the company. Today, our station master is a girl. On our way again. The track gauge is 1 meter 52, larger than in the rest of Europe where it's 1 meter 43. And another piece of information as we're crossing the Volga, this train we're riding in, the Trans-Siberian, has an average speed of 36 and a half miles per hour. And Glasnost has made it known that upping the speed is out of the question before the year 2000. The Moscow-Leningrad Express, which tops 125 miles per hour, will have no rivals. The fact is, the Soviet Railways has other pressing needs. New track, extending lines, renewal of the rolling stock. There's a samovar in every car. A cup of tea with sugar costs a penny, a bit less without sugar. There are two attendants per car, they take turns, each working one 12-hour shift per day. 38 attendants for the 19 cars that make up the train. Two Dutch tourists, Soraya Karam and Elvira Helmskerk. They're going to vacation in China, and rather than take the train, they've succumbed to the lure of the Trans-Siberian. And after Irkutsk, where are you headed? After three days, we head for Peking. Yes, Peking. Then again by train to Sihan. After that, the plane to Chengdu. Then we go to Gilin. The nature is wonderful at Gilin. Then we fly to Hong Kong. What do you think of these cars on the Trans-Siberian? The comfort, the personnel. Oh, the service is very good. The girls are very nice, but it's a bit hot. The food is good, and it's not very expensive. So we have a lot of money to spend on, uh, well, we have a lot of money left. From the second day, and especially the third day out, the towns and villages get further and further apart. We move through stands of beech trees and evergreens interspersed with clearings. The head conductor. The attendants are under her orders and they check the tickets. There are no ticket takers. She announces the stations and she plays the role of disc jockey, selecting the music for the train. three cooks, and a dishwasher. A vendor goes door to door through the train offering hot dishes. 
Sorry, no sandwiches, peanuts, or candy bars. There are two identical dining cars in the middle of the train, open from nine in the morning till nine at night. They close for two hours in the afternoon. You can get a good hearty meal for about three dollars. Wine, beer, and liquor are not allowed anywhere in the Soviet railway system. The hors d'oeuvres are sold by weight, not by the portion. Each slice of sausage is carefully weighed. No calculator, but the good old-fashioned abacus. An important landmark. We are now leaving Europe and entering Asia. Four girls from the Komosov, the communist youth movement. They're quite excited. They're giggling. What's going on? Well, we're students in a polytechnic school. We were sent to Sochi on an agricultural assignment. We were picking walnuts and tea. Now we're going back to Irkutsk via Moscow. And at Novosibirsk, we missed our train. We almost had to walk home. They let us get on this train, which will take us to the Taiga. We just hope we can catch up with our train. The next stop, the moment of truth for these girls. <laughs> Fog, rain, sleet and dust have all left the cars covered with a thick layer of dirt. There's no regular cleaning service, so if you want a clean window, it's a do-it-yourself proposition. Boredom has set in, and each traveler plunges into his own thoughts, rocked by a melancholy air. Imperceptibly, night follows day, which follows night. Is today Tuesday or Thursday? Little by little, we've lost the notion of time. Three o'clock in the morning. One more station, just like all the others. Where are we? Numbed by the rhythm of the rails, it's been a long time since we've even glanced at the map.
continues. The mail. Servicemen getting back to their units from leave. We're about to get moving. Nope, false alarm. The train is immobilized for more than two hours. It's an emergency. The wheels of the car in front of us were getting dangerously hot. They have to change the whole wheel assembly. Just how close was it to braking? Was this a near disaster? The train crew is not saying. You might think you're up against the usual Soviet smokescreen of secrecy. Well, things have changed. This extraordinary film you're about to see was given to us by the Minister of Communications. It's the minister, Nikolai Kodaryov, speaking. When will all the words be backed up by action? Do you fully realize your responsibilities to the public and to your superiors? What kind of political and national awareness do you have? Yes, it is possible to go through a bad quarter, even a second bad quarter. But when the commitments are never respected, it means you couldn't care less about your responsibilities and your work. The narrator continues. What you see here are not the ravages of war, but today's vandalism. This is how the users treat the cars. The country badly needs rolling stock, and we can no longer say that this is simply due to negligence. Putting equipment into service and repairing it are costly operations. The commentator also criticizes the computerized system of ticket reservations and sales. There's only one center in Moscow for a population of nine million. The employees are not always efficient, he specifies. He also points out the shortage of telephones, the shortage of trains. The system doesn't measure up, he concludes. Boris Tikmelyov, doctor of science, talks about development of locomotive prototypes. We've lost sight of the national priority. In France, they started this kind of research 10 years after us, but they've already concluded. They've decided to launch a series of locomotives with thyristor-controlled connectorless motors. 44 locomotives are already under construction. Where? In France, of course. And here? And here it's still dragging along. Novosibirsk, the third largest city after Moscow and Leningrad, a population of 1,400,000. This mushroom town has doubled in 20 years. It's the jewel of the new dynamic Siberia.
The daycare center of the station is resolutely placed under the edifying protection of Comrade Lenin. We see him as a blonde, curly-haired baby, then a little boy, an adolescent, a young man, as an adult, and lastly with a protective arm around his mother. Siberia has a higher standard of living than the rest of the country. 39-year-old Sergei Fenotko, engineer on the Trans-Siberian, owns a car, unlike his co-workers in Moscow. The fact is he earns 15% more than them. If he were to live even further out in the Soviet Far East, his salary would be 30% more, and in Kamchatka, 100% more. A strong incentive. The idea is to populate these almost uninhabited territories. Sergei and his family also own a dacha, a small country house, with a vegetable garden. They built it themselves, just like their neighbor is building his. The whole village, in fact, was built by the inhabitants. They don't own the land, it's on loan from the state, but they will be able to pass the house on to their children. It was Alexis, Sergei's father-in-law, who obtained this benefit as a veteran. There was only a one-year wait, he says. Sergei, the locomotive engineer, likes living in Siberia. Obviously, he enjoys being able to fish in these unpolluted rivers that he has all to himself. But there's more. There are the wide open spaces, which give a feeling of limitless freedom. They talk about Perestroika here, too. Do you have co-workers who are against Perestroika? Yes, and not only co-workers, I have friends, unfortunately, who are against it. If it weren't for them, the goals would already have been reached. Why are they against Perestroika? Well, there are the hard opponents, and then there are the soft opponents. The soft opponents are not actively resisting, but they do slow down the perestroika. People don't all think these things out at the same pace. We hope the perestroika will pick up momentum. Among your co-workers, is there an active resistance or maybe even sabotage? No, no sabotage, but more of an inertia. Not so much a physical inertia, it's more of a moral inertia. It's hard to change people's everyday habits. Now that's true. But there are also people who don't like to work, and they drag their heels on perestroika. 
Да, да, отдыхать перед поездкой. Ну, правильно. Или работа такая. Уже должны привыкнуть. The vegetable garden is their pride and joy. It does mean that much less time waiting in the food store lines. Sergei has started his shift. Every major station brings a new crop of local newspapers. We're changing locomotives. The Soviets designed them, and they're manufactured in Czechoslovakia in the framework of the Comicom, the Eastern Bloc Economic Alliance. Of the 5,810 miles of the Trans-Siberian, 3,900 miles are electrified. Diesel power covers the rest. Steam power was finally phased out on the whole network only in 1978. We begin to see snow as we approach Lake Baikal. The Trans-Siberian follows its shoreline for 170 miles. This is the deepest lake in the world, just over a mile deep. It contains one-fifth of our planet's fresh water. created 25 million years ago, and of the dozens of species of fish it contains, 27 are found nowhere else.
we find the same charm of the old timberwork stations in the izbas of Irkutsk near Baikal. Like this one, the home of Prince Trubetskoy, leader of the December uprising. On the 14th of December, 1825, a group of aristocrats rebelled in order to impose a constitutional monarchy on the Tsar. The rebellion was crushed and 120 Decemberists were exiled to Siberia. Trubetskoy stayed for 30 years. The princess was hostess to a renowned literary salon at Irkutsk. At that time, French was the language used every day by the cultured class. The Soviet rulers regard the Decemberists as true revolutionaries, and they honor their memory. In this region, they've succeeded in creating a second Trans-Siberian line, 2,600 miles long. It took more than 45 years. The work was often interrupted, but always resumed, and all under some of the worst geographic and climatic conditions on Earth. Much more than a public works project, it was an epic. It's the BAM, the Baikal Amur line, named after the mighty river of the Far East. It passes to the north of Lake Baikal. On the BAM line, we dug seven tunnels, constructed more than 50 stations, seven mountain ranges, the permafrost, seismic problems, a very dense system of rivers. The thermometer sometimes drops to minus 76 degrees Fahrenheit. On October 27, 1984, the line was opened. The BAM opens up enormous possibilities for transportation and industry between Moscow and Vladivostok. Back underway with our Trans-Siberian. The region of Khabarovsk is included in the vast project to develop the Soviet Far East and create a practically autonomous industrial and technical entity. 250 new enterprises have been set up. The salaries here are 30% higher than in Moscow. The Amur, a vast river, a natural frontier between Russia and China. The station of Khabarovsk. The 
mountains we see across the horizon are in China. Up until now, we've been traveling east. Now we head due south. The chess players have finally finished their interminable game. In the USSR, they like formal ceremonies. They are also fond of medals, so this is a perfect occasion. Nakobka, end of the line. Foreigners can't go all the way to Vladivostok. They have to get off here. we have it. The trip is finished. The longest train journey in the world, 5,810 miles, six days and six nights. For those who wanted to live out their dream of the Trans-Siberian Railroad, to exercise the spell of this mythical train, there's nothing left to see, nothing left to experience, it's over. For others, the Trans-Siberian is also a means of transportation, a way to get somewhere else, and a huge white boat is waiting for them. In two days, they'll land in Yokohama, Tokyo's port. There, it's a new adventure called Japan, and that is another story.
on the next World's Greatest Train Ride Video Adventure.